Is the microphone working? No? We've had a little trouble with the mic, so maybe I'll be preaching like Whitfield, and uh, you try to listen like his audience did. Maybe they'll get it fixed in the meantime. Uh, next week, we will begin a new series. I think I may have announced this, at least I did, to, I think the early service a year, uh, week ago, or a couple of weeks ago. We'll begin a series in 1 Timothy, but this is uh, the last Sunday of 2018, and we've set aside this Sunday for this combined service of the ministry of the Word and the Lord's Supper, and I thought it would be good to take a passage that I think is a good introduction to the new year that's coming, and that's Psalm 90. It's a passage that invites us to number our days and ask the Lord to confirm the work of our hands. It's a great way to begin the year, to consider the brevity of life, and the importance of time that has been allotted to us. So I'm going to read all 17 verses and then we'll pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are like grass, which sprouts anew. In the morning, it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening, it fades and withers away. For, you have, for we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence, for all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? and your fury according to the fear that is due you. So teach us to number our days, <clears throat> that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Do return, O Lord, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. So satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's pray. The older we get, the more we think about time. I speak from experience. St. Augustine thought about it a lot. He wrote about time at some length in his book, The Confessions. He asked, what is time? Then admitted, if no one asks me, I know. If I want to explain it to someone who does ask, I don't know. Moses also wrote about time. It's the subject of Psalm 90, the oldest psalm in the Bible. Like Augustine, he knew time, but didn't explain it. Instead of giving a definition, he gave a description of time in the early verses. 
It is a flood that sweeps men away like a raging river. That's the picture of time that he gives. I can imagine Moses as a young man standing along the Nile watching things float by as the mighty current would inevitably carry them out to sea and thinking, that's what time is like. It rolls on like the Nile or Mississippi, irresistibly carrying everyone and everything along and out into eternity when they fly away and are as forgotten as a dream that vanishes in the morning. The imagery that Moses uses is some of the most majestic and sobering in the Bible. We return to dust. Our lives are like grass that fades away. Our days disappear like a sigh. Life is brief. That's the lesson of the psalm, which makes it seem, as someone wrote, a little on the pessimistic side. God is set over against man. It's a reflection on human, human mortality, but it is not a despairing psalm. Moses considers our condition so that we will apply his lessons, which, give, which he gives to us in two prayers, in verse 12 and then in verse 17. He prays, teach us to number our days and confirm the work of our hands. They are prayers for a wise and productive life. That's what we are to seek with the time that we have. We are in this ever-rolling stream of time. But we're not like useless driftwood, carried away to oblivion. Time is God's creation and for His purpose. We're to use it for that, and God will help us. That's how Moses begins the psalm, by stating God's relationship to time and eternity and recalling how God has helped His people in the past. Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or You gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. If anything seems old, it's the mountains. They're like the great pillars of the earth. But they're just part of God's creation. Before the mountains were, God was. Always. He is eternal. And Moses took great comfort in that because he knew how fleeting and uncertain things are in this world. But he knew that God is an all-sufficient foundation. He knew it from history, and he knew it from his experience. He knew the life of the patriarchs, how they lived without a country, without cities and houses, people who dwelt in tents as pilgrims. But God cared for them consistently, faithfully. That had been his own experience. He knew what it was to be without a home. He knew what it was to be a fugitive and a nomad. He knew how unpredictable things in life are. How a man can be a prince in a palace one day and then out on the desert the next. There's no real security in this world, though men try to find it in all kinds of things, in all kinds of ways, from a large bank account to great houses to promotions at work. They search for a lasting home in this world, but there is none. Everything is temporary. We are temporary. Our only security is in the Lord, who is not temporary, who is eternal. And the person who is joined to Him through faith is eternally secure. He gives us a refuge in this life even when we don't have a roof over our heads. Moses no doubt thought of Israel and how God provided for the people out on the desert, leading them with the pillar of cloud and fire that 
shaded them in the day and warmed them at night. He was their dwelling place. And He's the same for us. The visible signs are gone. We don't have a great pillar of cloud to lead us. But He's guiding His people along every step and protecting us. We know that because that's what the Word of God teaches us. And we know that by faith. And so we are to be faithful. We're to trust Him. And as we go through this life, we will see Him demonstrate His faithfulness. And then at the end of it all, He gives us a home for all eternity with Himself. That's where time is carrying us. That's where our hope lies. Not in this world or the things of this world, but in the Lord and in His promises of eternity. That is security. Now that's how Moses begins the psalm. And then he builds his case for looking to the Lord and living for Him by reflecting on our condition. He is eternal, but we are transient, like smoke. Actually, Moses says, like dust. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. Moses had clearly been reflecting on the first chapters of Genesis when he wrote this because Genesis 3.19 states that the Lord said to Adam, you are dust and to dust you shall return. And at some point in every person's life, God says, return. And they do. We are all destined to become dust. That's not only a measure of our finiteness, but of our frailty. In 1962, Adolf Eichmann was convicted of crimes against the Jewish people and executed. The only man to be executed in the modern state of Israel. And because the authorities didn't want to bury him in Israel, they cremated his body and then scattered his ashes on the Mediterranean Sea. The man responsible for the procedure commented on what he found when he gathered Eichmann's remains and expressed his amazement at what a small pile of ashes was left. For all the, the power he had once held and the fear that he caused, in the end, Eichmann was just a little pile of ashes. But that's man. Whether it be the very worst of men or the best of men, we are just that. Abraham called himself dust and ashes. Men love the poem Evictus. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. But it's an empty boast. No, Paul was right. God gives to all people life and breath and takes it away. For all of man's confidence, we are dust. We are weak and brief. Moses highlights that by stating that with God a thousand years are like yesterday. Like a watch in the night. Moses' point is, Time passes quickly for us. We think of a thousand years as a long time. Think of all the things that happened during a millennium. Think of what has occurred in human history since the year 1000. Europe had not yet emerged from the dark ages and at the end of it, man is walking on the moon. Empires have risen and fallen. Philosophical systems have come in and out of favor. Generations have come and gone. A thousand years is an epoch for us. It's just a day in God's life. Even shorter. Just a watch in the night. Which most people sleep through and don't even know that it has passed. But even if people should flourish for a thousand years, even if you should live as long as Methuselah, 969 years, it's just a brief stretch of time. And Moses writes, God sweeps them away like a flood. 
And to impress us with our brevity, Moses writes in verses 5 and 6 that man is like grass. It sprouts in the morning, flourishes in the day, only to wither in the evening. That's a common sight in the dry climate of the Middle East. In the spring, grass and wildflowers grow up in the cool morning and they flourish on barren hills. But as the day passes, the hot wind blows and the sun scorches the ground and it's all suddenly gone. That's man. They fall asleep, Moses writes. Later in verses 9 and 10, he describes the days of our life as ending like a sigh, like a, a fleeting sound. That's life. Just a sigh, just a breath. Even a long life, one of 70 years, or he says, if due to strength, 80 years, for all its pride is still a struggle. And then it ends. It's soon gone, Moses says, and we fly away. So life, even at its longest, is really very brief. And it's wearisome with toil and sickness, labor and sorrow. Then it ends. It will end. But why is that? Why the sorrow and shortness of it? Is it just the way things are? Everything eventually runs down. It's the second law of thermodynamics, the natural tendency of things to fall into disorder. That describes it, but that doesn't explain it. No, the reason for brevity and death is given in verses 7 and 8. We are guilty morally, spiritually, that is the root of the problem. All mankind is under a sentence of death due to sin. Verse 7, For we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath. We have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before us, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. Moses still has Genesis 3 in mind and the fall of Adam and Eve. Adam's sin has affected all his descendants. We inherited his guilt and fallen nature. As a result, we all sin and God sees it all. Even our secret sins, those which we commit in our heart, which nobody else knows, only we, those two are laid open and bare before God. This is the reason for death, which underscores the seriousness of sin, of both uh, heart and conduct, the, the visible and the invisible, the seen and the unseen. Sin brings an end, and not only to the lives of men, but to all of their plans and desires. So Moses asks in verse 11, Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? Moses had seen it. Some writers have linked this psalm to Numbers chapter 20, which begins with the death of Miriam, Moses' sister, and ends with the death of Aaron, Moses' brother. Both had sinned by leading a rebellion against Moses, and neither of them entered the promised land. Moses didn't either. In the middle of Numbers 20, his sin is recorded, which kept him out when he became angry with the people and he struck the rock to give the people water rather than speak to it as God had instructed him to do. As a result, he too died outside the land. What might seem like a minor failure to us, he hit a rock with a rod. It was not minor to God. All sin is serious. It leads to great disappointment in life and it results finally in death. Moses has seen a lot of it. He had watched a whole generation fall in the wilderness due to its sin. Every day, 
he saw funerals. The desert was filled with graves. Every day, new ones. Moses was well acquainted with death and the truth of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. We all have an appointment with the grave. Man is frail, man is at fault, and man needs help. He needs the grace of God. And that's what Moses asked for in the last verses of the psalm. Verse 13, Do return, O Lord, how long will it be, and be sorry for your servants. Back in verse 3, God's rebuke to man was given in the words, Return, O children of men. And here Moses picks up the same word and uses it as a call or a prayer for mercy. Return, O Lord. Return in favor. It's a request that the Lord turn His wrath into kindness and be sorry for them in their weakness and be moved to mercy. And God does that. He's full of compassion. He answers such prayers. He enjoys giving help to the helpless. Moses asked for God's grace, for loving kindness and joy. Make us glad, he prays. Then he concluded with verse 17 by asking God to confirm the works of our hands. And He will do that. Nothing of this world lasts. It's all grass. It's all fleeting. Fame is fleeting. The greatest of men are eventually forgotten. Their monuments fall down. Their, their deeds are lost to memory. Nothing lasts in this world. Nothing done for this world lasts. But the things we do for the Lord last forever. Men may not see them. Men won't remember them if they do see them. And if they do see them, they won't care. But God does. And they become everlasting accomplishments which will become for us a crown of glory, Peter says. Moses knew that. He didn't despair over life's shortness. But the fact that it is brief and we fly away into eternity gave him a sense of the urgency of the moment now. So the lesson he drew from his reflection on the days of our life is given in the prayer of verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. That doesn't mean teach us to count them up like putting candles on a cake. But teach us to realize that each day may be our last and we are to value it. One of the first steps on the path of wisdom which leads to holiness and a life well spent is realizing that life is short and we must make each day count for eternity. We do that by living each day for the Lord, knowing that there may be no tomorrow. That's the counsel that James gives in James chapter 4, and verse 14. To those who give no thought to death, he says, you are just a vapor. Moses said, soon it is gone and we fly away. Time doesn't stand still and it doesn't back up. It is a river steadily flowing like a steady flowing river or a stream. And, and once it's gone, it's gone forever. So the wise person learns to number his or her days and use them wisely. The Greek philosopher Thales gave the advice, take time by the forelock. You hear that sometimes today. It uh, imagines father time without hair except on the front of his head. So if a person is going to seize the moment and make the most of it, he must grab the forelock when it comes because There'll be nothing to grab once 
it has passed. Opportunity lost. That's Moses' warning. Life is short. But Moses also taught that life is long enough and time is sufficient to be used usefully, not only for temporal blessing and temporal gain, but more importantly for eternal blessing. Time is not our enemy. It's a blessing. God created time when He created the universe. That's what happened in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That was before the fall. Time is part of God's creation, and it's part of what God pronounced to be good. The Christian is traveling on the stream of time that is ever moving toward the glorious goal of the kingdom to come. The whole creation is longing for that, Paul said in Romans 8, verse 23. And so, just as men have used the, the great rivers of the world for their advantage in travel and trade, we are to use time for the great work of the Lord as it carries us on to our eternal reward. God has given each of us time to use. He has put us in this stream. So we're to navigate it skillfully and purposefully. This is not a pessimistic psalm, but an optimistic psalm. We have opportunity to do great things of eternal, lasting value. We can only do that, though, by knowing what God has made us for. Knowing our purpose for existence. And we know that. You know that. The shorter catechism has told it to us. Paul wrote of it in an almost obscure way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Everything we do, all things, whether eating or drinking or whatsoever we do, do it all to the glory of God. That's why we exist. That's to be our function in this life. Are you a doctor? or a lawyer, a school teacher, a student, an IT person, or a mother and housewife? It doesn't matter. God has called you to that place in life to serve and glorify Him. Do it. I knew a man in Romania who was a good example of that. Emil was his name. He was an elder in a church I would visit in Bucharest. He saw God's hand in his life in remarkable ways. That happens when we live by faith, and he did. He would go to work every day, pass out tracts on the bus or the tram, look for opportunities to talk to people of Christ and His saving grace. He would use his weekends to go to villages and teach the Scriptures. It was what he enjoyed doing, and he lived his life doing that for many years. He lived for Christ. When I got to know him, he was old and feeble and housebound. It was rare that he was even able to leave his apartment and go to church. That frustrated him. His situation frustrated him greatly because he longed to be out ministering in his simple way. But I saw in that a great lesson for myself because he redeemed the time when he had it. He took time by the forelock when it passed by. So I thought he need not be discouraged or have regrets in his last years. In God's providence, he put that man in a different place place where he couldn't be active, except in private prayer and worship. But when he had the opportunity to serve, he used it and used it well. That's a lesson for all of us. Someday, if we live long enough, we will be forced into inactivity. But what a blessing it will be to look back in that period and know that we used time well when we had it. 
Mr. Spurgeon said in one of his sermons, Oh, may your deathbed pillow never be stuffed with thorns because you have been unfaithful. In God's goodness, He has given us time, ample time to use skillfully for His purpose so that our deathbed pillow should never be stuffed with the thorns of regret. And the river of time that we navigate daily flows to a crown of glory reserved for us in heaven. So may we learn to number our days so that God will confirm the works of our hands. In the meantime, as we travel down the river, the Lord God will be our dwelling place. He we are absolutely secure in Him. He will not abandon His children when the, the river of time gets rough. And it will. He will not allow us to starve. That's Psalm 37 verse 25. When we walk by faith, we'll see His hand of mercy and provision. When we live for His glory, He'll honor us. He won't neglect us. He is faithful always and He will see, we will see that when our faith costs us something. When it does, we'll see the Lord standing with us. That's the assurance of the first verse of this psalm. This is a psalm for Christians. It is the advice that Paul gave to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5.16 to be redeeming the time. It's also very much for you who are here who have not believed in Jesus Christ. You're lost. And time is a flood that will sweep you away. And you don't even know it. Age creeps up on us and the years slip away. And the greatness of all, the greatest of all opportunities is lost forever. The Lord told a story about that in Luke chapter 12. It's the parable of the farmer. There's a lot to admire about that man. He was industrious. He didn't waste time. He worked hard. Those are the things we admire. But he worked for the things that don't last. He never learned to number his days. He spent his life expanding his business, building more barns and stuffing them with more grain, until finally he decided it was enough. He was secure. He could now rest and enjoy life. Then God spoke. He said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared. What made him such a fool was not only his failure to number his days on this earth, but his failure to know the Creator of this earth and realize that he would be consumed by his anger. The question in verse 11 is a startling one. Who understands the power of your anger? The answer to that is, no one does. No mere mortal can comprehend the anger in God's judgment. Only one man knows it. God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered the full force of God's wrath in the place of His people. And He exhausted it so that all who believe in Him will escape it. The opportunity for you, if you've never put your trust in Christ, is to do so now. Today is the day of salvation. Take the forelock. Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Really, there's no better way to begin the new year than that. Clarence McCartney was a Presbyterian minister who was well known for the illustrations in his sermons. In fact, you can get a book of his illustrations. He told the story of an old Saxon king who put down a rebellion in one of the distant provinces of his kingdom. When the insurrection was crushed, 
and the rebellions and the rebels defeated, the king put a candle over the archway of his castle, lit it, and announced that all rebels who surrendered and took an oath of loyalty while the candle was still burning would be spared. The king offered mercy, but the offer was limited to the life of the candle. And as Mr. McCartney went on to comment, every offer of life and of time has its candle limitations. There is a limited period of time in which to make use of the offer and opportunity. And that's true of things in general. That's true of the things of this world, of education or business. We're not to waste time, but take the opportunity that's given. But more importantly, that's true for us in our spiritual service. We have opportunity. God has given us this amazing thing called time that, that we know but we can't really explain. But it's there and it's an opportunity to serve Him. And more importantly, it's equally true, I should say, of the offer of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, if you are here without Christ, turn to Him. We are more than dust or a pile of ashes or a collection of atoms. We are eternal souls. Entrust your soul to Christ. Believe in Him. He receives all who do. And then live for Him. He will establish the work of our hands and say to us someday, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we should long to hear. And we will hear it as we serve Him. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us, Your faithfulness to us. You have been our dwelling place in all generations, in this generation, in this present moment. We live and move and exist in You. And as believers in Jesus Christ, You're our Father. You provide for us not only life and breath and the material things of life, You've given us spiritual life, which is eternal life. And You're always with us. You never forsake us. And You will bring us safely into Your heavenly home and into the kingdom to come. Lord, may we see this life as oh so brief and seek to serve You with the time that You've given us. Time is a blessing. May we seize it and use it. We will be blessed for all eternity as a result. And blessed in the moment. So we pray for that. Pray for ourselves. And pray You would bless us with increasing knowledge and love of You. We thank You for Your Son, for His death for us. And now, Lord, as we turn to the Lord's Supper and remember Him, remember His incarnation, remember His coming into this world and, and His death for us, we pray that You would prepare our hearts for that. We thank You for Him. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your mercy. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.